Good morning. Welcome to our worship service today here at Central Baptist Church in Westerly. And again, I'm Cal Lord, and I'm honored to be the pastor to serve you today. Uh, I want to just share with you before we begin our worship a few announcements. Uh, immediately following our worship service today, we're going to have a short church meeting right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Lynn to hold off on the postlude. I'm going to ask Kathy uh, Cable to come forward, and we're going to do that brief uh, meeting, and then uh, we'll dismiss everybody, and Lynn will play the postlude. Uh, we have two orders of business, one to welcome, uh, to vote on the welcome of uh, three new members, and also to vote on the addition of Richard DiBernardo to the Board of Trustees. A couple of other things. I uh, just want to make sure you're aware of our Board of Trustees is planning an outdoor work party next Saturday morning at 9 a.m., and if you're able to come, that would be great. Uh, many hands make light the work, so that's next Saturday morning. Also, we have some group uh, Bible studies that are beginning uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. here at church. We also can arrange for a Zoom if you'd like to be a participant in that. They're studying the book of Ephesians. This week on Thursday at 2 p.m., we're going to start a Bible study on the 23rd Psalm. Again, that'll be here in Fellowship Hall. And again, if you'd like to participate, you can uh, do that by Zoom or in-person social distancing. And then a week from Wednesday, Jerry Maloney starts her women's Bible study, and that's going to be Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. down in Fellowship Hall. And again, we can arrange for a Zoom option if you'd like to participate, but still feel a little nervous about coming to church here. We are looking for Sunday school teachers. We anticipate opening our Sunday school in the first week of October, and so if you uh, feel called to do that, we'd love to have you and add you to our staff. Um, also, I uh, want to just let you know that we're, 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 what we're going to do is starting next week, we move back to our 10.30 a.m. worship time. Uh, and if you could call the church, we're anticipating some folks will be coming back, but if you could call the church and, and reserve a seat at the table again like we did when we opened in June, just to make sure our ushers are prepared and we have enough seating for everybody. We also are offering for the month of September a 9 a.m. parking lot service. So for those at home who may feel a little more comfortable, aren't quite ready to come back, some who are here who would feel more comfortable in the parking lot, that's 9 a.m. out in the parking lot and 10.30 here in the sanctuary. And the last thing I want to just share with you is, is this wonderful book. Uh, some of you have already bought it, but this is Josh McClure's book. This is his life story and it's inspirational, and again, there are so many things in there. It's called The Top of the Stairs, but talking about how God has, has a purpose and a plan for our lives, and, and we can see that as we look back as, as that strand, the, the weaving of things together. And uh, Josh was hoping that some people would read it and then see how God was involved in their life. And so we have some copies of this book downstairs. They're $15.99. Make out a check to Reverend Josh McClure, but it's a great book. Um, well, now I'm going to invite Lori to come up and to open us in the worship of the Lord. Good morning. Our call to worship today, shout praise to God. Let us praise God with music and great joy. God looks upon us with favor. God rejoices in our loving compassion for others. Thanks be to God who offers to us new life and praise be to Jesus Christ who taught us how to live. Join me in the uh, prayer of invocation. Lord, we come this day to worship and thank you for the many ways you guide our lives. We ask that our hearts, our ears, and our spirits may be open to your healing words of love. Join me in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you join um, with our first hymn, it's number 514, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine and it'll be on the screens.
As we gather together today, uh, I just want to remind you of a couple of things that you may or may not know about. Uh, one is that we're going to, uh, we've been invited to a, a birthday parade this afternoon at 445 uh, for Barbara Higgins. Barbara turns 80, actually she turned 80 yesterday. And, uh, and Harry, I, I heard, turned 80 last month. And so we're going to, anybody who's available, we're going to do a drive-by parade for their house uh, scheduled for 5 o'clock, but we're going to meet at 445 at the Lighthouse Community Baptist Church up on Pequot Trail. They've got a good area for us to meet at, and then we'll kind of line up, and then we'll head down to Harry and Barbara's house. Uh, if any of you would like to come along, or you know anybody else who would like to just honor uh, Harry and Barbara that way as they celebrate their 80th birthday this year, uh, just feel free to come on along. 445 at the Lighthouse Community Baptist Church. Um, it, it, it is wonderful. I almost wish that I could be 80 just so I could have one of those. Pr no, no, I, do, I don't. I don't. I was saying to Todd that, that uh, I couldn't believe uh, that Harry and Barbara are both 80. As, uh, I guess that must be a sign that I'm getting older and I can't uh, believe that anybody. No, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm digging it deep, so I'm, I'm sorry. Um, let, me, let me just lift up a few people in our prayers today. I want to lift up Bruce Titterington. I heard that he's been uh, struggling a little bit with his health, and so we want to lift him up today. I want to lift up also um, uh, Gary Engler, Linda Engler, and the Engler family as they've been going through some, uh, some challenging health concerns. I want to lift up uh, Paul Arnold. I had a nice talk with Paul today. He's doing okay, but he's been battling another infection, and so uh, if we just lift him up. Also, I heard that Nika Hall had a fall, and uh, Jim Collins was saying he talked with Arnold yesterday, and she's, she's uh, regaining her health and, and getting back on her feet again. But we want to lift up uh, Nika. I guess they're getting all set. They're planning to move shortly, and so I think uh, she probably just overdid it like many of us do with those type of events. I want to lift up our, our neighbor next door, one of our tenants, uh, Susan, who is uh, battling some health concerns, waiting on some tests, and we just lift her up in our prayers today. I want to lift up John Sr. Some of you will remember Dot Sr., who worked in her office for many years. Her son, John, we got a call that John has been in the hospital, and he had some surgery, and so they asked us to pray for him. I want to lift up Amy O'Brien, Sheila Martell's daughter-in-law, who had surgery. I want to lift up Jerry Maloney, who will be going back to for a, a repeat visit to the doctors at the end of this month, and we pray that uh, they'll have some insight into what she needs. I want to lift up Lori Willems, Joanne Faola's daughter, as she battles breast cancer. I want to lift up Debbie Burgess and Deb Collins. I want to lift up also Barry Bennett, Dave Johnson, Rosa Scarano, and uh, Regina Pendleton in our continuing prayers. And we want to also lift up uh, Norm Stedman. Uh, the men's uh, breakfast crew got a nice note from Norm uh, recently. He's, uh, he's saying that uh, he just misses the guys, but uh, he's got to take care of himself right now. And so he sent along his love to everybody. And so we lift up Norm in our prayers as well. And there may be others too. Uh, there was one young lady who I heard from a, a friend of mine, Fran, uh, she's uh, having some tests, and she's asked for prayers, so we lift her up, and Allison Beat as well. And so today we come, we bring these names, these individuals to the Lord's attention. We know He already knows what's going on. Maybe you've got someone in your heart and mind today that you're thinking of, and I want to invite you in this next few minutes just to lift up those prayers, lift up those situations to the Lord. We're going to have a moment of silent prayer, and then I'm going to pray, and we'll close with our congregational prayer. Let us continue in that spirit of prayer. Heavenly Father, on this beautiful Sunday morning, in the middle of Labor Day weekend, we thank you for the labors that you do on our behalf. Oh, Lord, we think about the greatest act, the gift of your Son who came and gave his life to take away our sin, to take the burden of our punishment so that we might know your grace and new life and the possibility of eternal salvation. Lord, we thank you for that gift, that work that was done. 
which forms a basis of our ability to be able to come together. For he established the church for all of us gathered here to be the body of Christ in the world, sharing the good news of hope. And Lord, this world we live in needs that hope now more than ever. Oh Lord, it seems like in the midst of a pandemic, people are becoming discouraged and worried and despondent. Oh Lord, as it seems to linger on, we wonder how long, oh Lord. And we echo the words of the psalmist who in their own day went through trials and tribulations. Oh Lord, even Daniel wondered in the midst of his captivity if he would ever be able to see his homeland again. And through his dreams and visions, he got discouraged at times, but then you gave him a vision of hope, which we talk about today. Lord, we ask you to be with those people in particular whose names have been mentioned either publicly or privately, those people who are on our prayer list. Lord, each of them with their own concerns, and we pray for their healing, we pray for their confidence, we pray for their restoration, and we pray, Lord, for each one. And We lift them up before you today to your throne of grace and mercy. You are the great physician, and so we trust you to bring healing where it is needed. Oh, Lord, be with each of us today as we gather here with our individual and particular needs. Oh, Lord, we bow before you, even as we lift up our arms in praise and worship. Hear our prayers, O oh Lord, as we offer them up in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, now hear the prayer that your people say as we come together with our congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, as we face the challenges of this new season, deepen our faith. Give us strength for each day and hope for the future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to just take a moment now for the children. A friend of mine gave me this, uh, this ornament. Uh, it's actually something that could go uh, on the shelf during the Christmas season because it kind of depicts the life of Jesus. And so we see in the beginning here, there's Jesus born a baby in Bethlehem, and then some scenes in his life as he interacted with different people. And then the end, they show him upon the cross with, with the witnesses there at the cross, and then his glorious ascension into heaven. You know, very often during the course of any given year, we talk about all of these different things. We talk about the birth of Christ at Christmas. We talk about the death and the resurrection at Easter. We talk about his engagement and interaction with individuals and some of the messages, the sermons that he preached and taught. But today I want to just remind you that all of those individual lessons come together to form a great and eternal truth. And that is that God cares and loves for each and every one of us. And so, boys and girls, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're going through. Right now, some of you are probably nervous. School has started or it's going to start. Summer's ending and, and we've got a new season in front of us. And you may be wondering what the future holds. Well, there was a man named Daniel who often wondered what the future held as well. And God gave Daniel a vision, very much like this vision, of a day when, when there would be challenges and difficulties, but also a day when God would make everything right. Kind of this whole picture of Jesus ascending into heaven from earth. And boys and girls, that's a promise that we have, that when you're worried or afraid, when you're facing challenges or difficulties, God wants you to know that he's got this. That he's in control and he has a plan. And he will be with you until that plan is worked out. I think that's a message that even us grown-ups need to hear sometimes. Especially when we're challenged by the events all around us. And so boys and girls, I want to thank you for watching this morning. For tuning in and being part of our family worship. Amen. I'm going to ask Lori now to share our scripture reading from the book of Daniel. From Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. 
Thank you for God's word. This morning we continue in our series as we walk through the book of Daniel, and today we're in chapter 7, and, and most of chapter 7, I hope you'll get a chance to read it, if not uh, already, uh, maybe this afternoon or sometime this week, all of chapter 7 really talks about a dream that Daniel had, and uh, it, it goes like this, the very beginning, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions pass through his mind as he was lying in bed, and he wrote down the substance of his dream. He says, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea and four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and a human mind was given it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear, and it raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And I was told, and it was told, eat up and fill your fill with flesh. And the vision goes on. You can imagine how terrifying that dream must have been to Daniel. You know, there have been times in my life where, where I would be afraid, and sometimes, especially in times of challenge, at night, I would wonder if there was a monster under my bed. No, really, maybe not recently, but you know, I grew up in a four-room, one-bathroom carriage house, and it literally was a carriage house before they turned it into a small home. It was 18 feet wide by 48 feet long. It was like a trailer, but put on a foundation. And actually, the only way you could get to the basement from the interior of the house was through a trap door, and that trap door happened to be in my bedroom. Well, you can imagine a seven or eight year old little boy sitting in his bed looking at that trap door, wondering if something was going to come up from there. Well, I shared that with my parents one day, and they did what parents did. They used their wisdom. How can we do something? And so they put my bed over the top of the trap door. And I remember my dad saying, don't worry, it'll never get up because they can't lift the door high enough to get through. Well, if that doesn't fuel the imagination. <laughs> and I can tell you that, and I know it sounds cliche, but there were many a night as a young boy where I would jump across the floor onto my bed because I was afraid that maybe there was something underneath the bed. Now, children have active imaginations, but let me tell you, so do adults. Many of us always tend to fear the worst. We let our imaginations get the best of us. Don't think so? Well, just try to remember the last time you were waiting on test results from the doctor. We adults have our monsters too, but we tend to call them cancer, Alzheimer's disease, loneliness, guilt, Pride, jealousy, you and I know their names because they're a part of our everyday life and they loom in the darkness of our world. Sometimes in the middle of the night, the monsters surface in our dreams and persistent thoughts. As a result, peaceful sleep eludes us. And I think this is probably what happened to Daniel. When King Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, God gave Daniel the interpretation and Nebuchadnezzar elevated him to a high position. When Belshazzar ruled as king, Daniel interpreted his dreams, and he rose to an even higher position. Landing on his feet again when the Persians took over, he rose to be one of the great leaders of Babylon. When his jealous fellow administrators got him thrown into the lion's den, the lions lost their appetite. We talked about that last week. It would be easy to end our study of Daniel after chapter 6 with Daniel on the top of the world. We would all want to be like Daniel, strong and courageous. Yet even on our best days, we know that we'd fall short. The truth is, so did Daniel. Below his surface demeanor of confident peace, Daniel was having his own dreams and visions. The last six chapters of the book of Daniel are the dreams and visions that he had, which are strange and awful, often puzzling. 
Yet they are given to us with important insights and lessons for us to carry with us. In chapter 7, Daniel flashes back to a time before the lion's den, even before the dream, which happened at the end of Belshazzar's reign. Daniel has a dream of a scary primeval sea and roaring wind with monsters in it. What a nightmare that was. Now, Daniel had many reasons to see the world as a place of beasts. In his dream, though, Daniel also sees the Ancient of Days. Or as we would say, he sees God in that dream. And God to him is scary as well. Maybe even more scary than the beast. Which is a good thing because it shows that Daniel held God in awe. His throne is flaming with fire, with blazing wheels. There's a river of fire flowing out from his throne. Surrounding his throne stands an unimaginable amount of attendants. That little horn, the outcropping of the fourth beast, is not awed by the Ancient of Days. And he continues to boast of his power. But finally, that fourth beast is slain and his body thrown into the fire. This tells us that God can handle any monster. English writer G.K. Chesterton said, Fairy tales don't teach children that monsters exist. They already know that monsters exist. Fairy tales teach children that monsters can be killed. Now, the Bible's not a fairy tale, but the stories like this remind us that monsters can be killed and there is one who can destroy them. Daniel awakens from his dream, and his reaction is surprising. He says, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the vision that passed through my mind disturbed me. Why was he disturbed? Well, as I mentioned, he had a vision of God. You remember what Isaiah said when he had his vision of God? He said, woe is me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty, you see... You see, Isaiah understood his human frailty, his failings, his imperfections. And when he saw the glory of God, he said, I have no right to be in his presence. And that's the same thing that Daniel felt. When Ezekiel saw a vision of God, we're told that he fell flat on his face and then sat silent for seven days, overwhelmed. Now, sometimes I think when we think of God, we've made him our best friend. And I think that's good. I love the the, the whole idea that, that God walks with me and God talks with me and He tells me that I am His own. It gives me strength and confidence. But I think the problem is sometimes when we look at God as our best friend, we forget the awesome nature of who God in all of His glory is. And I think Daniel needed to see that, to find the courage and the strength that he would need to survive and thrive in the Babylonian kingdom. The other reason that Daniel was troubled was that he realized he was stuck somewhere in the middle of that dream. Yes, God is on His throne in heaven, but Daniel is living on this earth where the beast still roam. So Daniel wants to know what we want to know. In the midst of this troubling world with all these things going on, and you know what they are today, it seems like there's always been these trials and, and turbulent waves of, of activity that's gone on that have thrown us for a loop. Daniel wants to know, what is God's plan for taming the monsters? Now, a lot of people have tried to identify the four kingdoms and that little horn. Now, we don't have time to do that today. Maybe we can get together in a Bible study this winter to explore the book of Daniel and some of these prophecies. Wouldn't that be fun? Well, let me say this. Whatever the interpretation, the final outcome is clear. God wins. In Daniel 7, verse 26, it says, The court will sit, and the power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms of under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. And His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. And all the rulers will worship and obey Him. God wins. It's a cosmic vision of the end of times, the end of days. 
And Daniel's vision ends on that note. But nonetheless, Daniel understands that we will have to face our monsters until that day. But we can face them with confidence because we know who the victor will be. Billy Graham used to say, I've read the book, I know the end of the story. God wins. And when God wins, we all win. Daniel found strength in his dreams and visions. He knew without a doubt that God was on the throne in heaven. And he had that miraculous experience of God's power, interpreting dreams and seeing them fulfilled. And then there was the lion's den, where the monsters were real lions, and God shut their mouths. I love that. Because God doesn't just act in the abstract, but this same God who can shut the mouths of lions can reach into our lives, come into our presence in the midst of whatever we're battling, and He can shut it down too, whether it be a cancer or something else. The last point I want to make is this. Daniel sees one, and he describes it like the Son of Man. This heavenly Son of Man in Daniel's vision is destined to reign forever. He walked on the earth. The Son of God did not stay safely in heaven to swoop down at the end of all things, kill all the monsters, receive His authority, glory, and power as King. No, He came to the earth like a Son of Man, where the powers of evil were strong. He became like us, representing us as He faced the monsters of life head on. We read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, He too shared in their humanity so that by His death He might break the power of Him who holds the power of death that is the devil. The monsters are a part of life on earth and we face them and Jesus joins us in the battle. Only after His death and resurrection did the disciples understand what Jesus did as a human. Jesus joined us in death to handle that last and greatest monster, death itself. I love that thought, especially when I have to preside over a funeral, because that's the hope that the Christian gospel can give to those who gather at the grave, that this is not the end, that death has not won, that in Christ we will be victorious. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, having disarmed the powers and authorities, the monsters, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. God raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. That's why we come to the communion table every month. We come to remember that we are not alone as we face our monsters, our demons, our enemies. God's long game is right in front of us even as we take that bread And we recognize the fact that our bodies, which are broken, have been healed. Our sins, which offend God, have been forgiven, even as His body was broken in our place. And we take that cup, and we know that His blood was shed, and we're told that a new covenant was written. A covenant greater than the covenant of Abraham and the covenant of David. A covenant now that would be for all who believe that death will not have the final say that in Christ we will find resurrection. That's God's long game. And He was revealing it even to Daniel in a dream hundreds of years before Christ was born. We will be more than conquerors, Paul says. And in the Scriptures we find that we will be the victors. I love the chorus of that Easter hymn, Christ Arose. You know it. Up from the grave He arose with a mighty triumph o'er His foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and He lives forever with His saints to reign. He arose, He arose, Christ arose. So how do we face our monsters in the world? Not by jumping into the bed. We can be like Daniel who faced lions with courage and strength because he knew God's long game. In fact, we can overcome anything we face in the power of the Son of Man, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Will you join with me now in singing our hymn of celebration, Standing on the Promises of God. I want to also invite those maybe who are at home right now, if you haven't prepared, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper immediately following this hymn. And so I invite you to grab some bread. doesn't matter what kind. Just grab some bread. It's symbolic. Grab some juice. If you have grape juice, that's great. Uh, grab some juice and celebrate with us around the Lord's table wherever we may be. Let's sing. This morning we come to the Lord's table, and I want to invite you to come and to open your hearts to the Lord. You don't need to be a member of this church to participate in the Lord's Supper. This is an open communion table, but it will only have meaning if you understand what happened, how Jesus gave his life as an atonement for our sins. He took our place. His body was broken. It was brutally tortured and murdered and put upon a cross to die. He bore the punishment for our sin. And then he was laid in a tomb. And when he laid in that tomb, all hope seemed to be lost. But God showed us that there was more to the story. And so it is for all of us. And so we invite you today to come to the table. I share with you these words that the Apostle Paul gave to the early believers he says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. After supper, he said, this covenant, do this, drink it, and remember me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will be proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. As we read through scriptures and especially stories like Daniel's, we're reminded that God has shown us that he is with us, that he loves us, and that he will help us stand tall. As we come to the table and we see the symbols of the bread and the cup, these are the greatest remember, remembrance that God has a long-standing plan and that you and I are a part of it. We're told by John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And today we celebrate and remember and tell the world that he is our Lord and our Savior and we trust in him. On that night when Jesus was with his disciples, as he was ready to give his life, he took the Passover supper which reminded the people that God still loved them, even though they were in captivity. 
and that he would pass over them with the angel of death and give them life and a new day. And so Jesus said, this bread, this bread which reminds you of the Passover will be a sign for you now that the angel of death will have no hold on you. The greatest enemy has already been defeated in my life. And so today we take this bread. We're told that that day, Jesus blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to all of them. And so today, we do the same. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread. O oh Lord, may we remember that our sins are forgiven and that we now have new life because of what you did on the cross. Your body was broken so that we can live again, live to your glory, a new life filled with Christ and his love. O oh Lord, bless this bread and all who eat it in Jesus' name. And he said to them, take and eat, all of you. And as the supper continued, they told the story of God's great salvation and how he had been with them and delivered them. Jesus lifted up the third cup, was called the cup of blessing, and he gave it new meaning. He says, this is the cup, the new cup of salvation. It's the covenant written in my blood. For my blood will be shed for you. And in the writing of this covenant, you will be with me forever and ever and ever. That was his promise. And as we come to the table, no matter what's going on in our lives, we can come and we can lift that cup and know that that promise is for us. That nothing will defeat us because God is with us. And so he told his disciples as he blessed that cup to take and drink. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup. And we remember that a life was given, your blood was shed, so that we might secure the promise of eternal salvation. That we might know the victory that you won. And that that victory might be ours now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. And he took the cup and he said to them, drink all of you, and today we drink. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You stand now if you're able and join with me as we close our service by singing, Blessed be the tie that binds. You know, I look forward to that day, and I hope it's not many months from now when once again we can all join hands and sing together and a circle around the sanctuary. But for today, we will sing the songs and join our hearts spiritually one to another. May the glory of the Lord surround you as you enjoy this week. Amen. I'm going to invite Kathy forward, and I'm going to ask you if you can sit down just for a moment as we have this short meeting. And I know for some of you who aren't members, um, we know this may be a little boring. That's what business is, but this is the Lord's business. Good morning. 
Oh, it's so nice to see all those people up there. Could, if, everyone who, if you're a member, if you could please raise your hand for me, please. Oh, good, we have a quorum. <laughs> so this is a special business meeting, and we have two items of business. One is to vote on uh, new members, and the second is to vote on a board of trustee member. So if I could have Phil Bryan from the chair of deacons to bring forward um, the motion for the vote for the membership, please. Can you take that off? I can't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> So we have a motion to accept three new members. Do I have a second? Second. I can give it to Meredith for the second. Sorry, Steve. All in favor, please raise your hand. There not being any opposed, the motion is carried. Welcome new members. Our second item of business, if I could have a motion, please, is to accept Richard D. Bernardo as a member of the Board of Trustees. We have Jim Collins has made the motion to accept Richard DiDonardo as the member of the Board of Trustees. Do I have a second? Got a second. All in favor? Are there any opposed? Being none, Richard, welcome to the Board of Trustees. I have a motion, please, on the floor to come to... Uh, <laughs> if I could have a motion, we can adjourn. If someone could do that, please. Anyone want us to stay? All in favor of leaving? We can adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. The dragons await. Go out and fight them in the name of Christ. Amen.